Okay, final part. I got other things to look at, so let's go over the last eight episodes and get this show over with. Episode 18 opens with something suspicious going on with the church. But then we jump back to the main group that got teleported to the nearest hero by Fatoria. This is to start the reconciliation between Naofumi and the other cardinal heroes, but the guy nearest to our protagonist is Motoyasu, easily the hardest one to get along with. We're not here to start a fight with you. Is that all you have to say for yourself, traitor? Devil of the shield! Can't you at least listen to me before you try to take my head off? I won't listen to anyone who uses a brainwashing shield to enslave Philo and Raftalia. Says the guy who was fawning over the woman who tried killing her little sister. Why did this idiot get his own spin-off series? And to make matters worse, Motoyasu also thinks that now Fumi is responsible for killing Ren and Itsuki. So they duke it out. But unlike the last duel, now Fumi knows how combo attacks work. So despite being in a level disadvantage yet again, he manages to defeat Motoyasu. This doesn't convince the spear hero to change his tune, but what's lost in all this commotion is... how something feels off. The soldiers that were here are all missing. Philo senses something is up and tells Naofumi to set up a shield formation. And right on cue, a powerful spell lands on them and decimates the area. Who could have done that? Truly remarkable. You just took judgment head-on, an exceedingly powerful group ritual. And yet you're still standing. <sighs> I'd expect nothing less from the shield hero. God damn it! And I gave him kudos in the last video too. And again, it wouldn't be a fantasy story without some kind of evil religion. Not that they weren't hinting at before, but still. So yeah, Biscus plans to overthrow the government after killing the royal family. All in the name of God! Our family are the only ones fit to- Abuse your power and disrespect the church. Look down upon the apostles of God himself. Not anymore. This country doesn't need such blasphemy. Royalty, you're a pestilence. Hmm, this could be the thing we need for her to become a better person. So guess what doesn't happen? Biscus also wants to kill the cardinal heroes because of how they endangered people, and he reveals that he offed Ren and Itsuki when they tried to investigate him. To finish the job, he reveals a weapon that was the actual thing those two were looking for. A weapon that can replicate all four cardinal weapons at once at the cost of some serious mana. Thankfully, he has a bottomless supply to tap into from the church. My brethren, the war we wage now is between our lord and the devil of the shield. It is a holy crusade which we fight in the name of the god of the ages. On one hand, seeing a religious zealot be beaten down would be satisfying, but that would also mean that now Fumi has to win this battle. Can we do a double KO by any chance? Naturally, none of the attacks can break through Biscus' magic barrier. However, we learn that Ren and Itsuki are alive after all, and their attacks start to make cracks in the bad guy's defenses. They said that they survived the attack and admitted that now Fumi had a point. Through gritted teeth, of course. As the fight keeps going, the bad guys realize they are on a time limit. They need to take care of business before the queen shows up, since fighting in her presence counts as treason. But even knowing this, and our heroes have their backs against the wall, these four still can't get along. We can survive just fine without your help. No, you can't! You don't stand a chance! You'll die taking the blame for a crime you didn't commit! Is that really what you want? I mean, he was already blamed for crap he didn't do. In response, now Fumi unloads on the other heroes, accusing them of getting them into this situation due to their negligence. It'd be a good dressing down if this tirade was made by someone else. But this is now Fumi we're talking about. The same guy who owns slaves and doesn't apologize for it. So his words do come across as hollow. Because while the other three are idiots of the highest order, 
At least they aren't looking to commit mass genocide, and they aren't trying to push the idea of human supremacy, unlike that sanctimonious asshole. And yeah, I might as well do this now. The reason why Naofumi is considered the devil is because of his predecessor, who argued for rights on behalf of the demi-humans. His advocacy placed him in great esteem amongst said demi-humans and made him a pariah, basically. So yeah, the great conspiracy around the shield hero is just cause some humans think they're the master race. Classic trope of fantastical racism, that's all. And these bigots couldn't even try to distinguish the last S.H.I.E.L.D. hero from Nalfumi because thinking is hard. Anyway, the main character decides to work with the other heroes, but only because Fatoria urged him to. The situation is so desperate that even Malty is willing to help, just in time too, as Biscus summons a magic cathedral, like a field spell from Yu-Gi-Oh. This while the Queen and her forces are slowly making their way toward them. And within the cathedral, Biscus's magic increases in potency, thus getting the cardinal heroes on the defensive. Now Fumi is unable to use his curses to slow down the big bad, they just now realize that the shield weapon is OP. Compared to us, you're way underleveled, but you're still able to keep up. Don't you think that's because of your shield? My weapon's not overpowered, you just don't know how to use yours. Not entirely wrong? But at the same time, tanks are still very OP in the right situation. It's here that the Rage Shield tries to take control of Naofumi, but with his close companions by his side, he takes full control of this incredible power to protect everyone from one of Biscus's AoE spells. This leads to a window of opportunity where all the Cardinal heroes can wail on the final boss. Honestly, this is a good action scene. With Biscus using illusion magic to create some bullet hell with arrows, this is somewhat intense. The situation finally resolves when the Queen shows up and paralyzes the Pope with an ice spell. This lets Naofumi deliver a finishing blow with a new spell with the Rage Shield. It seems to backfire when he gets drenched in his own blood, but then... <laughs> How can this be happening to me? I am an apostle of God himself! Well played, anime. Well played. All this fighting leaves the shield hero totally drained, and he collapses from exhaustion. He then wakes up in Melramark and realizes that he's been out cold for three days. And even now, he hasn't fully recovered from his ordeal. But he finally gets to sit down with the Queen to figure out what's going on. She says that each kingdom was supposed to summon one cardinal hero each, but her husband broke this agreement after the first wave when he summoned all the heroes to Malramark. His rashness forced the Queen into damage control mode, since the other kingdoms are still wondering where their heroes are. That's why she wasn't around to help Naofumi out, but she's finally able to with the arrest of the king and Malti. She plans to absolve Naofumi of his accusations and reward him handsomely. She's got other plans up her sleeve, but for now, we cut over to a trial held by the kingdom against two of its royals. The crimes of both Malti and King Altcray, might as well use his name now, I suppose, are laid bare for everyone to see. I guess Malty really didn't change after everything that happened in the last fight, and now we see her for who she truly is. Mama, please! Why are you being so cruel? To ensure a fair trial, you will be given a temporary slave crest. Mama! <laughs> the jury knows that Malty is a serial liar, so they put a temporary slave crest on her to make her tell the truth. If she doesn't, she gets an electric shock for her troubles. And yet they don't do the same for alt Cray, even though he's just as much of a liar as his daughter. Then again, I have issues with this. These two deserve every punishment that'll come their way, but using those slave crests for interrogation just seems like torture. Why couldn't they just use some magic spell that makes you say nothing but the truth? Like the Zone of Truth from D&D? And don't tell me that's not possible when they clearly have the power to alter footage from a magic crystal ball. I'd say anything is possible in this world. But yeah, the trial finds them guilty of collaborating with the church, even though they aren't charged with the Pope's crazy plans. 
Malty is also found guilty of attempting to kill Melty, and is charged with that false rape accusation. Oh, and just for taste, why not focus on Malty's breasts when the slave mark electrocutes her? Because that's what we need from a torture scene. Gotta give a turn on for the guy viewers, am I right? <laughs> it's now alt Kray's turn to testify. He justifies his actions by stating his fear towards the shield. So I guess we're leaving those reasons hidden until the next season. The defense doesn't hold, so he's gonna face the axe with Malty. And when now Fumi hears of this, he's not sure what to think. He's been dying for them to get some sort of comeuppance, but now that this possibility is staring him in the face, he's a little less certain. Despite everything that happened, is execution really the only way forward? This is probably the best chance for... This is probably the best chance for now Fumi to show that he's grown up, that despite him rightfully wishing the worst on his hated enemies, he isn't going to stoop to their level. He can just let them go and hope they can atone like he did. Remove the royal title and have them start from nothing. This actually ends up happening, but... Her slave crest didn't react just now. She's got such thick skin she dares to beg the guy she was trying to kill for her life and actually mean it. When you think about that, I wonder if the guillotine could even cut through. No, that's not even the worst part. Keep listening. So I've got a better idea. From now on, the king's name is Trash, and the first princess will be called Bitch. Uh, trash? <laughs> My name's not Bitch! By the way, Malty often uses the alternate name Mine when she's adventuring. How about that? Yeah, guess Bitch needs an adventurer name. How about horror? This crap here is why I can never accept Naofumi as a likable character. It's like they only did this just to enable the main character's worst instincts. And to further demonstrate this, because all of this was being broadcasted, everyone instantly falls in love with the shield hero. And the three heroes church loses all of its followers. And I think the animation might have taken a dip in quality. Anyway, there's now a new replacement faith, the Four Heroes religion, and the Queen invites Naofumi to a banquet as a celebration. He turns down the offer, but he does pledge his services to her rule. He is at least glad to have come this far with the people who supported him from start to finish. I'd end it all here, but there's still four more episodes, so might as well finish it off. So next episode, our heroes return to the Hourglass to finally get their upgrades. Their level caps are gone, but the main team couldn't choose what they want to become. This was because of Fatoria's blessing, according to the Queen, so she recommends an upcoming event for now Fumi and friends that will grant them bonus experience, which will prove plenty useful for the next wave. While learning of that, Raftalia gets into a brawl with one of the drunken companion members, and also Melty stops Malty from poisoning the food. Even after being saved from death, she's still up to no good. Anyway, the Queen suggests that the heroes give each other insight into their weapons. Now Fumi learns that he could obtain copies of other shields by touching them, on top of other neat tricks like auto-crafting and teleporting back to places he's already explored. The other heroes just argue about the best way to improve their weapons. Meanwhile, the shield hero tries out the copy system, and it works! Guess what he's gonna do next? Wait, stop! That was expensive! Ah, that was really rare! Hey, hey, you put that down! Try this! I'm going too! Fine! Do whatever you want! <laughs> what a scamp! On top of enslaving two of his friends. But at least he has the decency to stop by Raftalia's old village, which allows her to give a proper burial for her lost friend. It's also here where now Fumi meets up with these two, Lark and Therese. Two travelers from a foreign country, who just so happens to speak the same language. They were probably living under a rock this whole time, because they didn't know that the shield hero's name was cleared of wrongdoing. Whatever, these two will be joining the crew on a boat trip to that archipelago. And everyone is too seasick to pay attention to Naofumi as he goes on about their system abilities. They later arrive to Calmira, their intended destination, to begin farming these slime things for lots of experience. Too bad they aren't the only ones who got the same idea. But regardless, they gain many levels and better weapons. They then party hard with everyone, including Lark and Therese, 
who actually get in some training with the main crew later. And we see that the former uses a scythe, while the latter specializes in magic. But the plot moves forward again when Philo discovers a dragon hourglass in an undersea temple. It shows that another wave is coming in two days, and when news of this reaches the Queen, she tells her naval fleet to prepare and stand by. And look, a competent authority figure. Who would have thought? The wave eventually comes and the Navy handles the small fry, while now Fumi and company go after a giant-ass narwhal. It goes down after a while, but as they collect Luke, Lark attacks them. All right then, I guess it's come down to this. What the hell are you talking about, Lark? It's simple, really. For the sake of our world, you gotta die. So once again, we got humans who show up during a wave with the express purpose of killing the heroes of this world. What's that about? Turns out Lark and Therese are cardinal heroes from another world, which is also under attack by waves of its own. Now, why these two aren't back there to defend their world is a mystery, but that's a question for another time. These turncoats engage our heroes while sidelining the Queen's ships from the battle. But this party isn't going to get started without Melty, and together the two parties clash in, admittingly, an epic sequence. Like most anime, the animation and fight choreography is gorgeous when the occasion calls for it. Even Glass shows up to join the fight with Lark and Therese, so that also means a final confrontation between her and Naofumi at least for now. He uses his new Soul Eater shield to drain away her life essence in an attempt to make her stop fighting before she kills herself. For the sake of the world I love, I have no choice! <sighs> so the only way you'll ever be able to get rid of me is if you kill me! Otherwise, this world will end! Still not sure why you have to fight each other when you can figure stuff out. But that might require explaining how these waves actually work. Glass actually tries to convince Naofumi to stop fighting on behalf of this world. After all, it dragged him here against his will, and he hasn't been welcomed there most of the time. But this argument goes nowhere when Raftalia shows up to remind Naofumi of his true allegiances. So he goes for a Rage Shield ability, only for Risia, one of Itsuki's allies, to intervene. What the hell is this? Oh no. Come on! They were filled with cohol berries. With Glass paralyzed, Lark and Therese bail out on the fight once the wave ends. So the day was saved by a character we never got to know. Where is she? Oh, there she is. But after Philo rescues Resia, we learn some horrible news. Said drowning was a suicide attempt. She just got booted out of Itsuki's team. But why? She was accused of something she didn't do. Uh, I... I swear, it wasn't me! They said I broke one of Master Itsuki's favorite accessories, but I didn't do it! What an asshole! I guess Itsuki's other companions were worried about Risia becoming promoted within their party, but that only means another useful ally for now, Fumi. She's not gonna become a slave too, right? The Queen also meets the shield hero to reward him for his efforts. He decided to claim lordship over Seyvelt, which contains Raftalia's old village. He wants a home base that is dedicated to preparing for future waves, especially if he has to leave this world at some point. That doesn't really matter, because once we beat all the waves, you're just gonna go back to your world, and I'll never see you again. I never want that day to come. Yeah, well... Never! Be honest, I wasn't sure before, but I am now. That's why I came here. We're gonna start over. If we're fighting the waves or looking for new party members, it all begins here. So this means you'll undo the slave crests on your two closest friends now, right? Right? Anyway, season one ends with everyone looking forward to a new chapter of their lives. The credits roll with snapshots of what everyone is up to during this time including Belokis, who keeps gloating about having the shield hero as his number one customer. <laughs> so that's the rising of the shield hero, for now anyway. Good lord, the amount of cynicism is off the charts. 
but it's not even a thought-provoking kind of cynicism, because the characters are either incompetent or malevolent to a cartoonish degree. Oh, they don't even deserve to be called characters. They're glorified archetype parodies. The other cardinal heroes are just three stooges who cause more problems than they solve. This is doubly true for Motoyasu, who, by the way, still has Malty on his team despite everything that's happened this season. The bad royals are also self-dealing and corrupt without being particularly clever about it. Malty is the temptress who loves to cheat and scam people while her father abuses his office to enable his worst instincts. It could be a compelling character study as to why these characters do the things they do, which could spin off into an interesting commentary about crime and prejudice. But because we are given so little context to their actions, we're left to assume that their personalities, and the writers, are super shallow. And the hero of our story is just a jerk ass who stays that way. While Nofumi's fall from grace is at least shown on screen, it just doesn't justify his behavior afterwards. When the world treats him poorly, he replicates this punching down by buying two slaves who can't say no to him. But what really irked me was how he never even considered freeing Raftalia and Philo after some time, even as he treated them as companions, and saw the innate humanity and dignity that these two possessed. And finally, when the people who did him wrong get their just desserts, now Fumi decided to pour salt on their wounds in the most humiliating way possible. It's a power fantasy disguised as a character arc that includes a harem of waifus. So besides these aggravating characters, there's also nothing new that this show does that isn't seen in other stories from the same genre. I mean, where have we seen people fight other people of a different game world before? What a novel concept! And instead of doing something constructive, like figuring out how the waves work so that everyone can avoid needless conflict, these players just fight one another to pad out the runtime. We are going to get to the bottom of this mystery, but we'll need to sift through a crap ton of pointless battle filler before doing that. Good looking battle filler, to be fair, but filler nevertheless. Maybe the next season will be an improvement, since another studio will be coming over to beef up the animation. But honestly, I don't really want to go through the series again. It's a mean-spirited story that exists to teach people that slavery is A-OK, -okay, and that because everyone is the worst, you are free to stoop to that level. Sympathy and empathy for a select few, no one else matters. And even those select few must be subservient to your every whim and desire. Those are the big takeaways from the Rising of the Shield Hero. Let it be known. I'm the Media Hunter. Media's my prey, and reviewing them my way.